Hello, everyone. This is Elisa Baum. I'm Gwit Gaines, Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a minute, but first I need to conduct a bit of housekeeping. If you could please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me, that would be much appreciated. And uh, Let me take a look. Okay, it looks like everyone can hear me. Thank you very much. All right, next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered by a follow-up blog entry on GridGain's blog. In addition, a recording of this webinar and a link to the slides will be made available to all of you within 48 hours. I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar, High Performance Data Architectures for the Internet of Things. It's being presented by Grid Gain Solutions Architect, Christos Aratokru. And with that said, I will turn the floor over to Christos. Go ahead, Christos. Thanks, Elisa. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining for all the people out there. Uh, U.S., good morning and good afternoon to the rest of the people in Europe and who's joined there. So, yeah, a little bit about the agenda and what I'll be covering on uh, today. So I'll be talking a little bit about the current kind of IoT landscape, so what technologies are out there, a bunch of different use cases, uh, the different technology stacks, and hopefully try to understand different architectures uh, that are already being used and see how we can kind of apply that to... Uh, with grid gain or Apache Ignite and be able to solve a lot of these uh, challenges. So I'll be touching on a, a few points uh, in respect to the product around you know scalability, resilience, how you can build a highly scalable resilient platform for Internet of Things, uh, how you can do storage and caching around that, how you can do variable workloads which is a very interesting subject in terms of uh, uh, hybrid processing and then of course you know uh, finish off with some kind of talk about uh, stream processing and some Spark integration if that's of interest. And finally, hopefully we get some, some interesting questions towards the end to, to talk about. So I'll start with the kind of a basic timeline. I'm sure many of you have seen this slide or this image plenty of times. Uh, but what I wanted to show you here is kind of the really the exponential gr growth of uh, the Internet of Things and how, how more and more uh, devices are being connected uh, every day. So, very interesting stuff. Back in 2010, I remember I started playing with a bunch of kind of microcontrollers and, and smart devices, building all sorts of kind of robots using Arduinos and stuff. And very fast, you know, after that, uh, we see a lot of kind of wearables coming into the market with the watches, uh, some clothing and, and stuff like that, some rings, which was very interesting. And then as, as you kind of move forward, you can see the traffic of these things will start to increase and put a lot more load than we expected uh, initially. So there's a lot of growth. And I, what you really need to notice here is by 2020, it's anticipated there's going to be over 30 billion connected things. So that's, that's a huge number of, of devices connected, uh, trans, transmitting information, and lo a lot of processing that needs to be be done there. And of course something that's actually happening right now, very interesting, the Internet of Flying Things. So uh, a lot of people are showing a lot of interest in drones. Uh, we can see that. Uh, there's a lot of traction to that. Uh, we can see a lot of investment in terms of Amazon made the statement where they were saying they would be doing delivery using drones. So uh, that could go uh, uh, very, very fast and uh, very interesting to see how, how that's going to actually take shape into the, into the future. And of course, you know, uh, all the new cars that are coming out right now, they're, they're more and more connected. I think Apple was also working on some sort of smart car as well. Google is investing a lot in this kind of self-driving cars and stuff. So uh, just basically very, very interesting kind of, kind of growth in this kind of sector here. So, yeah, crazy, crazy slide here. So this was kind of, I found this online uh, by the guys over at uh, First Mark. So Matt Tark put uh, this slide together. I, I got to give it to him. He spent a lot of time gathering all these logos, so that's pretty cool. But basically what it needs to show here that actually whether you, you know it or not, there's a lot of kind of activity happening in the Internet of Things, and whether you know it or not, you have come across a lot of these, uh, these things and technologies already in play. So what I'll try to do in the next couple of, couple of slides as we expand is try to see, you know, is there any sense that we can make on this? Can we create some sort of reference architecture? Can we come up with some sort of technology stack that allows us to kind of tackle a lot of the, the issues uh, around IoT. 
So before I go into that, I'll talk a little bit about the current kind of use cases that I see and that we've seen with our kind of product and a lot of our, our customers. Uh, smart metering or smart homes, that's a very interesting subject. I mean, uh, already we, we do have a customer that's already implementing this in the U.S. in terms of smart meters. Uh, here in the U.K., uh, it was announced, what was it a couple of months ago? I mean, British Gas and a lot of the the other suppliers here are investing now into smart meters, and they were saying by 2018 they're all going to be having smart meters around the houses. Uh, home automation, you see Google invest uh, a load of money in, in terms of buying Nest and, 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 and working on home automation systems, so very interesting kind of uh, use cases there. Wearables, I mean, this is a given. You know, I'm sure you know about all the watches, the Android watches, the Apple watches that are coming out. A lot of clothes are also just around the corner that we're still working on in terms of uh, interaction around that. Find my keys, that was a very kind of popular thing that I, I've seen in the last couple of, uh, the last year or so in 2015. A lot of kind of Bluetooth keyrings and stuff where, uh, or different tags where you tag physical items and be able to track them in a, in a digital world. So pretty big use case right there. And another interesting one, I know slightly different, it probably requires its own even session to discuss that, but virtual or augmented reality. So you saw Facebook investing a huge amount of money in, in buying uh, Oculus Rift and exploring this whole kind of uh, virtual reality. So to make, this, to make this happen, there's a lot of kind of innovation happening in terms of new sensors, new human computer interaction devices, uh, new ways to kind of map physical uh, reality to virtual reality. So this could show have a huge influx of different devices and sensors in the physical world that allow us to create this virtual and augmented uh, reality. Then manufacturing, actually a much more pragmatic one that's happening uh, right now, that's uh, really with uh, kind of tracking uh, the production line. So, for example, if you're building a car, or you've got some sort of kind of process, is there a way where I can deploy a bunch of sensors, scan this, kind of information and come up with uh, some sort of uh, idea of a, a, and a way to kind of streamline my production process. And, and this is already happening in car manufacturing, I know. But a very interesting story here is around kind of uh, the oil kind of industry. We had a customer or a story that I happened to know a couple of uh, years back, and it was about the drills that they would use in terms of, uh, of oil drilling. So one of the biggest problems that these guys had was their drills breaking. I'm sure you've seen kind of Armageddon. It's not as dramatic as that, but it's, it's pretty dramatic when, it, when a drill breaks for these guys because this is costing them millions uh, of pounds every time, you know, something like that breaks. By the time they get it out, they get the new one in, they get all the pieces out. They got, all, got a lot of people on the bench, you know, waiting that they're getting paid and they're losing a lot of money. So these guys were looking for a way to be able to track and understand how their drilling process is happening and can they run some analytics or some analysis on top of these kind of sensors and this information that they're gathering to be able to predict when, when their kind of uh, drill is going to break. So very interesting kind of uh, use case there in terms of being able to allow to do that. And, and transportation, as we said, you know, intelligent traffic control. I've seen all, all the kind of Uber guys, the taxi drivers nowadays, they're using these, these apps. I'm sure there's more than one in terms of kind of traffic uh, control. So it's all about, you know, all these uh, users broadcasting anonymous information about, you know, their travel and how it's happening. And if there's a way to be able for you to find a better route uh, through traffic. So uh, very popular. Uh, kind of app and use case that's coming up. And of course, self-driving vehicles, which I think this is probably going to go uh, hand in hand or probably complement each other. Google, I think, you know, they rolled out their first kind of self-driving car uh, a couple of months ago. That was last year, I don't remember. And a few of other ones. I think Mercedes as well is working on self-driving stuff. I think it started all with self-parking and stuff. So uh, this is definitely going to look to expand. But, you know, all these kind of opportunities don't uh, just come on their own. They always kind of bring challenges. And the most kind of inherent one that you can take away from this, and the first one, I tried to uh, capture a few of them that we can try and address and discuss over the next few slides. Uh, but the first one, I mean scale. You know, we're talking about, if we take reference to the first slide and what Gartner said about 20, 13 billion connected items by 2020. That's, that's a huge scale. So uh, the ability to be able to take information from so many uh, devices and actually infer and create some sort of useful uh, meaning out of them is, is very challenging. Uh, 
Uh, and almost at the same time speed, you know, it's, uh, of course I can scale out, but if I can't do it at, uh, at the right speed, then it's actually pointless. Take for example when you're doing the drill, if I don't get the, w with the oil drill, if I don't get the right analytics and the right kind of information in the right time, if the drill breaks, then it's too late for that information. The same with the tra kind of traffic control. If I don't have that at the right uh, piece of time, then actually the information you're, you're giving to me is probably false and, and creating more damage than actually good. So speed, very, very important scale. And distribution, you know, we're talking about the Internet of Things. So all these things will be connected anywhere and anytime. So they can be in any kind of... Uh, geolocation. So the geo distribution is very, very important in here. So how, how do we address that? You know, it could be multi-site deployment. Our services really need to be dynamic and have the ability to, to cater for such uh, use cases or uh, requirements. Security, it's almost a given. You know, it's uh, inherent that, you know, there's going to be a lot of kind of personal information being relayed during this time, whether it's going to be about your house, about your home automation system, about uh, your location, about a lot of different sensors and stuff. So it's very important that we secure this and we offer the best kind of privacy protection on top of this data. Of course, you know, there's use into kind of anonymous information, but sometimes this needs to be known and we need to know how to protect that. So omni-channel, you know, first time we heard this was kind of in e-commerce, e but what I'm trying to think there is really well, any device, any path. So take, for example, when when I'm looking at my location or when I try when some sort of app is tracking my location it shouldn't matter whether I'm on my phone whether I'm using for example my watch or whether I'm using my laptop or my car you know they should all be able to go through uh, you know similar paths and all end up in the same kind of back end or the same operation if they're executing similar uh, kind of uh, operations and actually the most important here for me because I think we've addressed kind of the the above in one way or another in different kind of solutions and different kind of use cases that we've seen around. But I think variable workloads or, you know, hybrid kind of workloads, and we'll talk more about this as, as we move on. So that's the ability to actually be able to execute analytical and transactional workloads. So transactional workloads are your typical kind of operations where you've got a payment, for example, you know. And actually a lot of people don't even notice this, but one of the first Internet of Things kind of uh, case or uh, deployment was actually uh, ATM or cash points, you know, those are actually distributed, uh, you know, devices that are able to execute uh, transactions on, the, on your account and give you money in a distributed fashion. So that was actually one of the first uses of, uh, of, of connected devices autonomously. So uh, having the ability to execute transactional operations is very important, but then analytical, you know, if you look at, for example, when you're tracking the traffic uh, applications and having the ability to predict uh, you know when a drill is going to break that's all analytical processing so that's the ability to ask interesting questions on all your data and run statistical analysis to be able to predict or come up with some interesting sort of information that actually will be meaningful for you to uh, in the future either to make money or to protect uh, your investment so very interesting to see how uh, we can do that in uh, one system actually or how we solve that challenge so I'm going to start and talk uh, about start with a simple architecture. So if we talk about an Internet of Things, what is, what does this really look like? You know, this is a bunch of devices or things if you want to picture them. So your mobile phone, your Raspberry Pi, Arduino's, BeagleBones, or cars or whatever, and these can all be connected to a backend system or the server, which actually you know has all the uh, the processing and actually transforms the information and creates meaning out of. Uh, these devices, otherwise they would be meaningless. Uh, they can connect either two ways, they can connect directly, they can have their direct kind of connection through Wi-Fi, Ethernet, use their own kind of uh, integration, or they can go actually through uh, an aggregation kind of layer, where it's a high-speed gateway, if you, if you will. So think about uh, when you're running Bluetooth, for example, you could have some sort of Bluetooth-enabled store where you're tracking different uh, operations using Bluetooth, and then if you want to broadcast is always make this available online, you would go through a gateway and then that distributes and pushes it back to your back-end system. So uh, there's generally kind of two ways you can integrate, almost similar. But what's important you can see in the top, you can have a multi-site uh, deployment. So that's when we're talking about having two distinct uh, geolocations or more than two actually to be able to cater for a, 
this kind of uh, spread out and, and distribution of, of, of things. Okay, so if we take that, you know, all the architects out there, all the designers, they always like to see reference architectures. So I found this actually online, got inspired by the WSO2 guys. Uh, they, they were kind of presenting something similar uh, to this kind of reference architecture. It's pretty straightforward, really. Um, so if I start from the bottom, you can see your devices, uh, whatever these devices need to be. And you've got some sort of communications layer, so the protocol that you use by which you can communicate, HTTP, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or whatever, NFC. And then you've got what we want to say as an aggregation layer. So all this information really needs to funnel through something and you know, be able to track that information, be able to replay any of, the, of these messages. So we really need a kind of a resilient layer there in terms of our messaging. So this could be an ESB, could be any sort of message broker like RabbitMQ or Kafka, or it can be any sort of kind of implementation of a gateway uh, as we were talked uh, previously. And beyond that, where it becomes more interesting, so is the events and analytics uh, layer. So the HTAP. So that word was coined by Gartner back in 2014, and it means hybrid transaction analytical processing. So that's the ability, like we said in the pre-slide, to be able to cater for both uh, kind of workloads. So that's the layer. I mean, we'll talk in the next few slides how we actually try to solve that. But above that, You've got your standard kind of web access portal where you can access your devices, run some sort of maintenance or checks or, or whatever kind of user uh, use case you want to cater for and whatever your users need to access. You can have a dashboard, for example, where your analytics uh, may lie, where you can run your predictive analysis and you can run your kind of batch operations uh, on that data. And then, of course, an external API. You know, everything that's being kind of driven nowadays, you almost... Uh, it's almost certain that you need to uh, expose some sort of external uh, API to your services. So what good is it if you're creating all this information if you're not making it available for third-party systems to be able to, to use that? So, And then on the vertical, you can see, of course, you've got your kind of device manager, so some sort of implementation where you can uh, uh, manage your physical devices, understand, you know, do their deployments, uh, do their updates, uh, and just manage uh, the lower level kind of uh, cases with these devices and of course you know security at vertical as a whole is kind of the access control or role based access so how do you actually define who accesses this these devices or these services and these kind of operations so so if i look at the middle piece what this kind of reminds me a uh, kind of hybrid uh, processing really kind of rings a bell when I look at the Lambda architecture. So if you're unfamiliar with kind of the Lambda architecture, it really talks about having two distinct layers, the high speed layer and then the batch uh, layer. So one would be probably something like a real-time processing and transactional uh, engine where the bottom on the slow layer would be some sort of analytical historical kind of processing. So typically in the top you'll have something like a, a, a caching system, a compute grid, so something like, I don't know, Redis, Gigaspaces, or Hazelcast, and then you have something like Spark uh, and so forth to do the processing. And then you can have something like Hadoop with Hive on the, on the slow layer or the batch layer where you can perform your more kind of historical uh, analysis or uh, analytical workloads, if you, if you will. So what's interesting with that is uh, can we take that and apply it to Internet of Things? So it turns out, yeah, it's, it's very similar to what we're talking about. It's about you know having the ability to do fast analytics, uh, event-driven processing, and be able to store uh, and run some long-term historical analysis when that's uh, necessary. So very similar. So what we're showing here is on one side I've got the uh, the items or the devices where they can connect, they can communicate over batch data or, or streaming data, uh, access this through a, a message bus, and then the access the service with the, where you can have your fast analytics, events processing, and, and storage. So what we're really looking at here is for a way to be able to do hybrid transaction analytical processing. Uh, in one kind of solution. Now, a lot of the ways, you, a lot of times, you can stitch up a number of different kind of technologies and create and cater for this use case. But is there a way where we can actually do that in one go? And it turns out here's a code actually from 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 Gartner where it says how important this 
kind of uh, hybrid processing will be in the future. You know, this is back in 2014. And they were already anticipating that this will be a, a use case uh, of the future coming up. So any kind of technology that is able to cater for both these kind of workloads will be in a significant kind of uh, market leading uh, opportunity. Okay, so like I said, there's, there's ways you can actually solve this. One of the stuff that's out there right now in terms of Internet of Things, and I'm sure if you guys have worked or are aware of this, you've got the SMAC stack, which actually stands for Spark, Mesos, Akka, Cassandra, and Kafka. So yeah, it's, it's pretty long. Um, as you can see, I mean, the middle layer, uh, we can see Kafka, that makes perfect sense. But already the middle layer, the one thing that stands out to me is that there's a lot of investment. There's already a lot of players in the picture right now. Uh, so this would be, if, you, if you're starting new and you're just getting started, there's a significant investment in terms of technology that needs to be made and in terms of skill set, you know. You're gonna, you can get people who know Spark, get people who know Cassandra, uh, and people who are, are uh, Java developers and can work with Akka, but, uh, you know, finding someone that could do all, all three, for example, you can, you can do that, but it's not ideal. Uh, and then Mesos, of course, to run Spark on for the resource management. So already, I think the complexity here is is high enough. So what what I'd be looking to do is try and see if I can flip this on his head and use grid gain to be able to simplify uh, this architecture. Turns out it is the case uh, you can use grid gain with, uh, as we said, in-memory data fabric uh, to be able to do that. So. We do allow transactional and analytical processing and persistency and, of course, event processing. And uh, what I'll try and show really what, what, what this is at the end of the day is a high-speed data and compute layer. It's, a, it's allowing you to have a layer where you can execute computations, you can execute transactions, you can, exec you can have data storage, you can have persistency, you can have event storage, and all this in a very highly scalable and linearly scalable way. So. First of all, let's take a step back. What is an in-memory data fabric and why is it able to, to, to cater for this kind of uh, use case and how does it actually solve it? So, first of all, an in-memory data fabric is just a collection of in-memory components or uh, modules that actually you know, work very well together, well finely integrated. Uh, they're all developed as part of the same product, so integration testing is, is very important. And it's, gen and it's generally, it's generally, generally, use cases but in essence all aligned to provide high performance and distributed computing and, and, and on, on the high volumes of, of data in near real time. So if I look at these components in slightly more detail I'm sure you probably come across with different modules of these but uh, separate out not as part of one technology maybe yes maybe no. But take, for instance, a data grid. You know, this has been around for a number of years. They started as simple caches uh, sitting on top of a database. It's really a distributed hash map that is able to store uh, objects or, or maps. Uh, in a, it's key value store, in essence, uh, that we are able to query. So we, there's a lot of kind of stuff in this domain. So it could be in-memory databases, in-memory SQL databases, in-memory object stores, uh, or it can be in-memory key value stores. Uh, so a lot of kind of items in that domain, and this, this, what, what we're trying to do there is have the ability to store data in memory, so fast reads and fast writes as fast as possible. Then you've got compute grids, you know, the traditional kind of uh, HPC computing where you had a high performance compute grids. Uh, usually the financial services would use stuff like that to do risk analysis or all sorts of complex calculations and quantitative analytics, uh, which was very interesting. But a lot of the same time, this guy has to be kind of a stateless uh, grid. Whenever, take for example, you need uh, to maintain some sort of state in your compute grid, if you're not shipping the data with your job that is being executed, then it's very uh, important that you have a way to actually make a call out and go get the, the data from somewhere. Now, if your compute grid is all running in memory, and you need to make a call to a disk-based database to get your data, turns out it's not going to be the most efficient. It's not going to really work. So already you can see how these two components can work very nicely together. So if I've got an in-memory data grid and an in-memory compute grid, they're already complementing each other. So I can jump out from the compute grid, go grab my data, execute my processing, write it back into the grid, and, so, and move on. So pretty cool stuff. 
And then you've got the service grid. So that's really having the ability to run in-memory services. So I'm sure you're familiar with the kind of traditional architecture in terms of you know, service-based uh, oriented architecture where you can have a service implementation on the server side and then the client can consume sort of uh, interface. So really uh, with an in-memory data fabric you can run that in memory. So it's having the ability to deploy uh, grid uh, service instances across this distributed data grid that, uh, or compute grid that we are running at the same time. Uh, streaming, so that's the ability to actually uh, ingest or, or read or take in as much data as possible. And what do we mean about streaming? It's really, this aligns very well to kind of uh, IoT here because this is endless kind of information coming in. There's no beginning, there's no, there's no end. So we really need a way to process that uh, in real time. And, you know, in terms of looking at grid gain or more specifically, you can see there's a, a lot more to it than just the data compute service and streaming. There's Hadoop acceleration that comes out of the box. So if we were incorporating Hadoop as part of the, uh, the topology or the deployment in the IoT, then that's certainly something we can leverage uh, grid gain for. The same thing for using a file system. We can leverage an in-memory file system when it comes to grid gain if you're serving files out as part of your kind of a use case or scenario. And of course messaging events and, and any kind of lower level uh, data structures that you might use. So, uh, and just another kind of uh, idea on how this aligns to being a fabric, you can simply think about it as the fabric that sits between your client applications and your data or your persistency layer. So it's a thin layer that's running in memory with all the different components, whether it's streaming, data, compute, Hadoop, uh, any sort of client on the top, uh, from Java to .NET to C++, any sort of API or interfaces from SQL to MapReduce to uh, Memcache, all sorts of APIs that you can use there. So really what we're trying to show here is that this is a layer in between your actual applications and your real persistency. Uh, and, uh, and in essence, kind of using memory to speed this up. So a quick step back here, just, just to make sure everyone's understanding the kind of uh, the significance here and, and what grid gain is and what Apache Ignite is. So I've been tossing the words around. I'm sure you've, some of you already know. But really, uh, grid gain is uh, the enterprise version of Apache Ignite. So Grid Game first started back in 2007, uh, the first kind of uh, release that we have. Uh, it started as Office of Compute Grid, we developed the data grid, we developed the service grid and a bunch of different kind of modules that came with it, Hadoop acceleration and all that cool stuff uh, that comes with it. Fast track about, you know, seven, eight years later, we're uh, 2014, we contribute our whole code base apart from one or two uh, enterprise modules that we kept. Uh, to the Apache Software Foundation. So, uh, really big contribution, uh, very uh, mature project. It was the fast, the second fastest actually to graduate after Spark. Uh, so, uh, it's, a, it's a flourishing community, a lot of contributors, it's rapidly growing, and you can see there's a huge development momentum. And you know, don't take it from me, go check out uh, on Open Hub, you can see all this information there. It's actually a snapshot for, from back in February, so I'm sure this has changed. Uh, quite a bit, but generally what I want to show here is that grid gain is the enterprise version of Apache Ignite, so if you're really going to roll out into into production, you can always use the open source version, but we're very sure you're probably going to need some support to do that, and that's where we come into the picture. Uh, so overall, back to kind of our subject that we're talking about in terms of uh, Internet of Things, so grid gain can solve the IoT challenges, the kind of architecture that we talked initially. So we said about scale, speed, distribution, security, single path, and you know mixed or hybrid uh, workloads. And we'll see over the next few slides how we can apply this using grid gain. So already you can see I switched out a few of the components uh, where I had my fast analytics, event processing and storage, and now you see I'll switch that out with the compute grid of grid gain, the data grid, and external persistency. So already we're consolidated a lot of our uh, implementation or our design that we have in our back-end system uh, with one kind of core technology. So 
if you can have a team uh, of people that can understand one technology, understand how to use the different APIs for the different uses, it's much better uh, to support even from your side and even from the vendor side, rather than to have multiple technologies and multiple points of, of failure. And like I said, the one, one of the most important things uh, that is here is actually that a lot of these components, the compute and data, I scroll back actually to, to this slide. That's fine. This this could work, but uh, the integration between them is not guaranteed. Of course, you can get the vendor of each of these uh, to support the integration between them, but it's it's not actually something that comes out of the box. And the main difference that we're presenting here is that all those components that allow you to deliver these different kind of workloads are very well tested and integrated uh, together. So you shouldn't have any problems uh, in terms of stability uh, for that kind of core component of your design. So, okay, so as we gonna look a bit more into kind of the technical stuff here, uh, we'll look at in individual components, uh, these three, and see how we deliver each three using GridGain in more, in more detail, but uh, at the high level, first of all, let's take a, a step back and, and look at this as a, as, a, as a big picture. So I've got a back-end system. The first thing that I really wanna solve here is I really need to be able to scale uh, my whole kind of uh, infrastructure here and my whole deployment. So how can I make, achieve scalability and resilience using, using GridGain in this instance? Uh, so first of all, with GridGain, I mean, it's an in-memory partitioned, uh, sorry, distributed uh, system or platform. So inherently, we do have the ability to provide partitioning, so the ability to par partition your data and hence create as many partitions as necessary and scale out on any number of kind of computers or, or machines to support the processing or data requirements. Now, uh, of course, as we're taking the approach and we're preaching in the sense of uh, using grid gain as a primary data store, being in memory, you do really need to provide kind of me methods and mechanisms of kind of resilience and how do we are able to do that. So a simplest way put, if I look at the partitioning, uh, take for example when I have, uh, let's take the example with smart homes or smart meters actually, that's a very good example. I've got five million homes, uh, I've got 10 sensors per home, so you know, 50 million uh, sensors. I've got five physical servers, and what you want to do is you want to partition across using a using, using the affinity key as, a, as the as the using the house ID, ID as the affinity key. So what does that actually uh, end up happening? House one will end up in node one or JDM one or server one, and then house five will end up on server five, and house two on two and three and four and so forth. So we'll do almost like a round robin in terms of how we're distributing and partitioning uh, our data. So when we want to add resilience, so each of these kind of primary keys that are residing, we can declare any number of backups for these keys. So this means, if you see also in the picture there, uh, if I have one backup per primary key, then it means in the case when I have four servers, I can lose one server, I will still have all my data available and I could be able to recover with no kind of data loss or service loss. Now, you can declare any number of backups. So I could declare two backups, hence kind of increasing my, uh, decreasing my risk. So then in that case, I could lose two servers, for example. And then you can go to the rather more extreme where you have every, a fully replicated cache, where you have the data in every single node. Of course, those are, you can use it in different use cases as well. You can have a fully replicated cache when, you're, when the use case is gonna be very uh, read the heavy. Uh, so it's easier to spread the load, whereas with a partition cache, you can have a very write-heavy kind of load. And take for the example that we said, uh, in terms of kind of partitioning and, and affinity, and, and what does this really mean? So if I had, and I split up and I partitioned my, uh, my homes or my households over five nodes, like we said, then the sensors, uh, information, if I had 10 sensors, uh, smart meters or, or whatever have you for each of these households, then I want to insert it in the cache using the same affinity key that I use the household. So this uh, will determine, this will mean that all the sensors that are for household one will reside on the same node that the household uh, data set resides. So hence, if you want to do any kind of operations, you will always 
operate on the same note because it's probably very likely that you know one household is going to be very related to its own sensor. It's going to be rare that uh, you're going to have sensors related to different households. Hence, what we're doing there is we are already partitioning and using affinity to determine where data set lies. And then you'll see how we can use also compute affinity to be able to execute operations on the right uh, node as data is coming in. So picture this, when a sensor is now reporting uh, changes in its, uh, while it's de detecting different changes, the path this will take, uh, if it's for household one, then as it's using the API to write this uh, change, then GridGin will automatically route this operation to server one, where this data is, and not actually broadcast to the whole server to be able to do that. So already you'll see how it easy it is to start splitting up uh, your loads and having a very linearly scalable kind of system. Now what's uh, really important here, that all these operations, in terms of consistency, because we're, we're dealing with data here in most of the cases, there could be topology changes, but we can always guarantee uh, while the data consistency, and we can have from transactional consistency to eventual consistency. So uh, one thing that I didn't actually mention is, as you see in the picture, we've got four nodes here, or in the case of the example I was talking about with the households, we have five servers. If I, you know, I see my load is increasing, I've got a, a number of new users kind of joining in, it's very easy to add uh, a new node on demand and not having to pull down the whole service uh, start up with more number of partitions and repopulate actually. Uh, with GridGain you've got the ability to do dynamic rebalancing so that's with adding or removing nodes into the grid. So this can be very very important as uh, you're moving forward into the solution. And, and again, once again what I was trying to say is that any of these operations if it's really impacting data consistency then you have full flexibility and full control on how you actually uh, manage this. So it could be a full sync replication. So remember with the primaries and backup, I, I could choose that uh, when I write the new key, the primary is created and the backup is created and then I assume that the operation is done and, and I send the acknowledge back to the customer. So it could be fully transactional. Uh, the same way with the rebalancing. We can have blocking uh, operations to the grid whilst rebalancing is happening. Or you can have eventual consistency with no blocking. So it's fully flexible in the way on how you actually configure and you manage that. And of course one thing that I didn't mention is also near caches. So if it's the case that the, the clients or for example think uh, the device or the gateway that is running some sort of intermediary service or aggregation before it's pushing to the back end, if it's doing heavy reads for example and you know this could be cached information nearer to the client rather than even having to go back to the server to fetch that. So it, speeding it even up even more. And of course we'll push any updates that will occur in the in the centralized system to to the individual clients that are outside the main cluster. So that was kind of for horizontal scalability. If I look a bit more around kind of vertical scalability, there's also the case where you can scale out in terms of the RAM. Uh, a lot of the cases with JVM products like our own, there's an inherent kind of limitation in terms of using beyond heap. You're not going to see generally more heaps than than 30. 30 gigs. So what we're really uh, able to achieve here is have a higher dense, uh, server density in terms of nodes. So whereas before I would have X number of, uh, of instances running on a server, I can have much, much less instances now and leveraging the full capacity of the RAM. And what you're also uh, capable of, possible of doing here, there's also kind of local uh, restartable store, what we'd call. So you take a snapshot of that data, so everything that's in memory, we take a snapshot, we keep it on the disk, and then when you're restarting and you're warming up your grid, you would be doing this in parallel rather than having to uh, move and hit a centralized kind of uh, DB to bring all that data. So you can fundamentally change kind of uh, the deployment, the operational process, and really uh, the updating process of your, of, your, of your system and your solution when you roll it out. And of course, you know, we talked about geo distribution when it comes to Internet of Things. So you really need to have the ability to be able to cater for different kind of uh, locations. Remember, US or Singapore or, or Europe or whatever have you. And 
with Gradient, it's, it's really easy to be able to set up multiple clusters in different locations and have the ability to synchronize between them. So your devices could be accessing, you know, you can have a mobile device accessing uh, through any path and actually getting back to exactly the same result, even if it's uh, distributed in a completely different location. And of course here, if we're dealing with data once again, there's ways where you can have, you know, conflict resolution, how do you pick which one's the right one in case, you know, I'm in a network kind of split scenario. And of course, you can run it as active-active, so or active-passive if you want to do disaster recovery. But probably in this case, active-active uh, active would be much rather uh, appealing, I think, to the Internet of Things. Uh, okay, so now we talked a little uh, about you know the whole kind of picture and how we can scale that out and how we do vertical scaling, scaling out, uh, scaling in, scaling out, and scaling up or down. But let's look at the individual kind of components of this kind of architecture that we discussed and see how we can do that using GridGate. So first of all, storage. You know, we want to be able to store our data. It's a data grid, as we talked uh, previously. It's fully JCache compliant. So if you're familiar with kind of simple cache APIs or map APIs, then it's going to be straight out of easy out of the box to be able to, to integrate and use this. There's also the ability to actually execute business logic or code close to the, the actual entry itself. And of course, uh, what's important here is pluggable uh, persistence. So uh, it's the ability to actually store not only in memory, not only on the local disk, but if you want to push further out to uh, a centralized data store, a distributed data store, then it's possible to very easily integrate with this store and have mechanisms like read through, write through, or, or write behind. So I could be doing all my processing in memory, uh, keeping some sort of states in memory and then pushing out some historical data uh, to an external persistency there where other systems or other applications can actually access and execute any any stuff there. And if you're running actually a SQL database on RDBMS, you've got a, a very cool uh, mapping wizard that you can use to actually connect to the database, extract, create all the mappings, all the POJOs, and off you go in a very uh, fast way to be able to configure this. So. Overall, a map API, very easy to access, object store, store stuff in memory with the ability to also kind of push uh, stuff in an external persistency layer. Uh, of, of course, the cache APIs, how, how can you actually query uh, this data? There's a number of different kind of uh, interfaces, and this is where it's going to align nicely to the types of workloads we can run, because we talked about hybrid kind of processing, which I'll touch on the next kind of slides coming up. Uh, you've got predicate-based scan queries, so you can check, for example, hey, we have, bring me back all the households where, you know, the sensors have reported a, a reading higher temperature of X, Y, or Z. Um, text queries, you know, you can search, uh, simple searching, you know, just, just like Lucene, or uh, you can use SQL queries, which is very, very important when we're doing analytical processing. And then if you've got any sort of client, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in Python, uh, or Java, or Ruby right now. Uh, there's ways you can access the grid and, and use a native kind of API to access that. Or even use the, the, the HTTP REST API that's exposed that as part of the uh, grid app, uh, server when you, when you deploy it. And if you're using JDBC or ODBC is one I didn't add to the list, then you're very welcome to, to use that as well. So I just wanted to show you here the number of different ways we can actually interface and, and get data out or get data in to this uh, uh, data grid. So very uh, full flexibility in terms of what your clients can be and how they can access this back-end system that we're designing. Okay, so what about mixed workloads? You know, that was one thing that I was touching upon as quite heavily and being very important. So it's the ability to do kind of transactions and analytics at the same time. So First of all, uh, out of the box support for SQL. If you're going to be doing analytics, it's still the king in terms of the query language. You know, what else could you possibly use to ask interesting questions of your data? Uh, there's a lot of technologies out there that are using kind of, you know, kind of SQL-based language or develop their own SQL language that's kind of similar. But with GridGain, you get ANSI 99 compliant SQL. So if you're already using some sort of queries, uh, they're running slow, you just want to switch to some sort of faster system, then it's very easy to just switch over to something like grid game. Uh, and of course, you know, given all our kind of resilient mechanisms, these are going to be very resilient, consistent queries, fault tolerant. So if it fails on one server, we'll push it onto the next one and so forth. And, uh, and of course, you know, no limitation in terms of the uh, 
uh, in terms of the aggregations or group bias filtering and all this stuff uh, you can run using SQL joins, unions, and all that stuff. And of course, ad, ad hoc SQL support. So you can use Visor where you don't really need to have client application or anything running on it. Uh, you can just execute uh, ad hoc SQL queries uh, on demand and as you like. So very important to be able to have this capability when you're doing analytical uh, processing, executing analytical workloads. Uh, here's a very simple example if you're going to grab the slides later to see how you can actually do a group by. So it looks almost exactly similar how you would do it in a SQL. And then transactional processing, sort of transactions. So a lot of the data grids you see out there nowadays, so they will have transactions, but not to the extent of you know your traditional databases. We're talking about fully acid uh, transaction support here. So that's the ability to be uh, fully consistent on your data set. And not only that, have the ability to to declare whether you want these transactions to be optimistic, pessimistic, and whatever kind of isolation mode you wanna you wanna run. Uh, pessimistic kind of locks being that you know will obtain the lock on the transaction start or on the field get, and then optimistic will try to obtain the lock uh, on the commit. So basically, what we'll do if you're touching upon a bunch of different um, fields, there we'll do a scan and 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 see if any we'll do a comparison if any of these fields the versioning has changed and then we'll throw an exception. So this way uh, we don't we avoid locking uh, the data un unless it's really, really necessary. And of course, if you're using a standard JTA uh, manager, then you're very welcome to, to integrate with that and use your existing uh, manager. So already you see the two important things. If you're going to be doing mixed workloads, you need to have support for full SQL capabilities and full ACID transactions. So a system that is able to to, to use both, then we'd like to see I call this as a, a hybrid uh, system or a hybrid transactional analytical processing uh, system. Uh, event processing. Okay, so this probably falls in between these two uh, in terms of how do we do event-driven processing. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of the common use cases I get is with data coming in, can I create a chain of events? Uh, or processing or processors or listeners where they can massage the data, change it, transform it, and then, uh, you know, finally push it out to some sort of uh, third-party external downstream system. Uh, so how do we actually do that in, in, in Gradient? A very simple ways actually to use continuous queries. You know, in the first kind of instance we saw with the Smack stack, they were using something like Akka, which is really kind of a, like a framework that you can apply to a standard kind of Java application. There's some libraries you can use and stuff, but it basically just uh, assumes the use of actors and and delegates the work to different actors and stuff. But you have a similar kind of way you can do this in, in a grid gain or event driven processing, and that's the ability to declare an initial query, not necessary, or just listen to some sort of changes, a specific changes to the data set and be able to, um, to trigger some sort of logic when some sort of filter gets triggered. So take, for example, you know, ATMs or some sort of distributed uh, kind of payment system, and you want to do kind of event-driven processing. So you can have different processes. One is like for validating, one is for verifying the payment, and one is actually for executing the payment. So uh, you can create a series of events. So what you can do here using GridGain is actually deploy each of these processors or, or listeners or continuous query you know, executors as part of your server. And, and not only that, but you can actually control, these are async uh, processors that get deployed. You can control the number of threads or pool for each of these uh, kind of processes and how they run. So how many kind of validations can you run? Uh, so you can control, you can throttle the validation, throttle the verification, and throttle the execution uh, process, for example. So what this means, is a new payment request comes in, what does that mean? It's actually just a data object that we write into the space. Uh, and that this gets uh, picked up by the first guy, it does the validation, once it's happy with it, it either rejects it or writes it back into the grid with the right status. So either ready to be verified or rejected and returned back to the user. If it's ready to be verified, then the next uh, kind of processor in line listens to this uh, checks for the, for this kind of state and then executes its kind of processing there. So already you can see how you can create a kind of a chain of, of event processing here. 
here is a simple kind of code example that we could run. And moving you know, towards kind of the end here of what we're, what we're trying to, to show, in-memory streaming is another very good case. So take, for example, real-time analytics. If we're doing some sort of uh, traffic analysis, I want to see, you know, what are my, how many cars have been in a specific road or part of the road in the last hour. How you can do that is actually you can create a sliding window or an event window in grid game, which actually is based on eviction policies. So all this data is coming in, but this catch will only, the eviction kind of, or the timeout on these entries will be set to one hour, for example. So then what happens, all this data is coming in, anything that's older than an hour gets, you know, evicted, thrown out of this specific cache. But within that window, you can actually use your standard kind of SQL processing or any kind of API that we mentioned previously to actually query this kind of data and be able to uh, find real-time analysis and, and run whatever kind of uh, operations you, you want to run. And of course, you can always deploy continuous queries as part of this event window. And you can create any number of windows that you require for hours, for for days or, or years, if you will. You know, it's really up to you how you want to design the system. You can actually do the execute some meaningful tasks or jobs on top of the grid as we you would use uh, Spark. Then it's very easy to use a grid game compute grid where you can execute a bunch of runnables or callables or tasks onto the grid, which this, these can actually call underlying or bring underlying data set into the picture, perform some operations on the data set. It can even include SQL queries as part of the computation. So all we're doing is we're packaging up a task as a runnable and executing it across the grid. So we can do a broadcast, we can do an affinity run. So like we said before, if I want to perform a specific task or operation or a data change on something that I know the key is, and this is a partition, uh, kind of cache, and it's very easy to execute an affinity uh, run using my computation, and that will redirect the operation to the correct node. And of course, you know, another thing that you probably use a bit more low level, you could always, uh, you know, use your own kind of uh, distributed data structures as part of your, your application that you're designing, so anything that you're uh, you're designing that needs to read some sort of data or needs to keep some sort of state, and there's a lot of kind of data structures that you can use from, you know, Atomics, Countdown Latches, or even the distributed executor service for your tasks to, to execute. So pretty flexible stuff uh, when it comes to, and powerful when it comes to, to this implementation. So in-memory service grid, very, very briefly here, uh, basically this is the ability, as we said uh, earlier, to be able to deploy services in memory. So having the ability on top of this grid, data grid, and pute grid that I'm running to be able to run a sort of de uh, deploy um, a service that is able to access this underlying compute and data grid. So rather than having direct access to the compute and, and data grid APIs, you can deploy a service instance which could be your own kind of interface and then you can use a client application to access this service rather than accessing uh, grid gain. So very easily you could deploy, for example, REST APIs or on the periphery of, of your grid gain cluster. Uh, these could be cluster singletons, meaning there's one instance running in the whole cluster, or even node singleton, meaning there's one instance uh, per, per node in, in the grid. So pretty cool stuff, and uh, one of the best practices if you're going to be designing something in grid gain, then it's probably useful and sensible to kind of ring fence it using an in-memory, uh, using the service grid kind of uh, architecture to be able to do this. And as you can see, there's a simple kind of uh, diagram here on how you would be able to do that. So you can see the services are living on the outside uh, conceptually. Of course, they're on the same nodes. It could be on separate nodes, if you will, and protecting the kind of main operations in the grid. And just briefly, while I just kind of close off, we've got a couple of slides, and now we're reaching towards the end. I want to leave some time for, for kind of questions. But if you're already using Spark, and you know you've hit some some kind of issues there. There's a direct kind of Spark integration. So if you didn't like kind of the switch that we did uh, with the architecture and remove Spark and put Grid Gain, you want to use Spark as a compute grid. And it's very easy to just use Ignite as a data grid, help you alleviate a lot of the the trouble you get with Spark in terms of you know uh, 
non-shared or non-mutable immutable RDDs, uh, you, you can get the Ignite RDDs or what, as you can see in the, in the diagram, which allows you to access any kind of uh, RDD from, from any kind of Spark job. So, and of course, faster SQL. If you're going to be doing SQL as part of Spark, then it's very easy to be able to do this. Uh, since we keep the memories in indexes, if we keep the indexes in memory, we can be much, much faster as uh, when you query this using Spark. And just finally, I think this is my last and relevant slide here that makes what we can wrap up. Uh, deployment support. So, you know, the first kind of thing uh, talked about Mesos, so you could deploy Spark on top of Mesos very easily. You can uh, uh, Ignite and uh, grid gain is, com is compatible with Mesos or Yarn, so you can deploy it on top of your resource managers. It's fully Dockerized. You can run it in Docker. You can run on Amazon, Google Cloud. Uh, it's compatible with all these different stuff, even OSGI with Apache Caraf, if, uh, uh, if you're using that. So very, very flexible in terms of kind of infrastructure integration. If, and, you know, given the kind of flourishing community, if it's not already out there, I'm sure it will be coming up in the next couple of uh, months or so. And just a final one, just to, I think, close off back to the kind of reference architecture and how this, this kind of looks. I think you could always uh, see how we can apply grid gain. So we use for the HTAP kind of processing, we use grid gain, compute, and data grid. For access portal, we've got something, you know, you can, of course, design your own that accesses grid gain, but you could always use uh, grid gain visor or the web console to access and understand what's going on in your cluster. Or you can use also the web console to create different dashboards where you can uh, run ad hoc SQL queries and actually have real-time charts and graphs and, and tables being updated. So there could be your real-time analytics coming in and then we're pushing it out there and, and creating some very interesting kind of representations. And of course, external APIs, if you want to provide external APIs to your other systems, it's very easy to deploy a service grid. We just talked now and be able to deploy a lightweight jetty container, for example, that has your REST API across that. And if you want to do security across the whole kind of cluster that's running in there, then it's very easy to uh, integrate with your existing kind of uh, security protocol, whether that's server or LDAP, Active Directory, or whatever have you, uh, using grid gain and, and go through that. And that will also secure your data access and uh, multi-tenancy if you're running multiple devices or multiple uh, sectors. So, Overall, I think uh, if, if you're looking to build some, some IoT platform, it's probably worth, worth uh, the effort to have a look at Grid Gain or Apache Ignite if you're starting with the open source version just to have a look. Uh, and of course, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, we'll give you any help that's required or not on these lines. So thank you and looking forward to answering a bunch of questions you guys have. Hi, Christos. Okay, so there are a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, the first one. having sample apps connecting all the pieces together would be great for developers. Is there an IoT reference application using grid gain like Java Pet Store? So just to clarify, that's, I think, if we have some sort of example or, or solution that we can share. I think so. I think it's a reference application. I think it's a reference application. Yeah, I think we don't have something at the moment, but it's certainly something that we're we're working on. And I think what I'll probably do as part of that, because I've got some other engagement I need to do with this kind of domain, and I think we're probably going to have it in our next show. But I'll probably follow up in, in my blog post and see if I can include some sort of demo application that demonstrates uh, part of these uh, architecture that we talked about. Uh, and sure, I'll follow up with some examples in my blog post. Let's do that. Okay. Well, there weren't any other questions. Okay. Well, there weren't any. So um, you did a great job. So I guess the, the presentation answered everybody's questions for the most part. And uh, with that said, I'd like to thank you for, for taking the time to do this for us today. And audience, thank you so much for attending. And we hope to see you on a future show. Thanks again, Christos. Thanks, guys. And yeah, feel free to post your questions, send it over to us, and uh, I'll see how I can answer a lot of them in, in my own time. OK. Um, also, just one last uh, question that came in. I'm going to be sending out to everybody a link to both the slides and the webinar recording so that 
will be uh, processed this afternoon and probably sent out tomorrow morning first thing. Okay, well, that's it for questions. Thank you again, everyone. Have a good day or, or uh, night, wherever you're calling in from. Thank you. Bye-bye.